We started a series uh, a few weeks ago, and a couple weeks ago we talked about a, a, a woman's dream husband. Last week we talked about a man's dream wife. All the men were really excited about that. And today we're going to talk about arguing well in this series called Family Therapy. We're going to have arguments. In fact, you're in the Lord's house, so tell the truth. Have you ever had an argument with your spouse? Would you raise your hand up? All right. We, we all have. That's just the way it goes, right? So let's open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, or 4 rather, verse 25. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Let's stop there. Father, this morning I pray as we study your word that you will inspire us and encourage us to be the kind of people you called us to be. And God, I pray that we'll especially desire in our hearts to be kind to our spouses and the kind of, of husband or wife that you've called us to be, to, to reach out in the name of Jesus each and every day and ask for courage and strength to become all that you want for us to be. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Have any of you uh, married couples figured out yet that men and women speak different languages. <laughs> I mean, a woman can say something and mean it one way, a man will hear it a different way and vice versa. We speak different languages. There's no question about that. And we ought to have some kind of dictionary that helps us link our understanding together. Uh, but we address, because we speak languages, different languages, we address our problems differently as well. Like, for instance, if a woman comes and says to her husband, I've got this problem. And she begins to talk about the problem. And the husband will naturally say, here's how to fix it. One, two, three, A, B, C. Done. And that's not what the wife wants, is it? Because men are fixers and women fix things by talking it out. That's what they do. I saw a video uh, a long time ago. You may have seen this before. Uh, but I, I chuckle every time I see it. I think it's hilarious. So I want you to watch this video. It really describes the differences between men and women. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me. And I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head. And it's relentless. And I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop thing, trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. Yeah, well, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, you're out. not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. That sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just... Don't! <laughs> <laughs> I love that little, that little video right there. But... Well, conflict is really not the problem because we're going to have conflict. Anytime you put two humans together, there's going to be disagreement. There's going to be conflict. That's not really the issue at hand. The issue at, at hand is how will we address the conflict? How will we seek to fix the conflict? How are we going to handle it? There are thousands and thousands and thousands of people that get divorced 
each and every year here in America. And sometimes they cite the reason they're getting a divorce is because of irreconcilable differences. Irreconcilable differences. Did you know really among Christians there's no such thing? There's really not because any problem with God can be worked out. I mean, if we'll just give it to Him, say, God, we're not getting along well. Uh, we feel like there's irreconcilable differences here. And God would say to us, I can fix this. If both of you will submit to me, we will make this work. Well, the problem's not irreconcilable differences. It's irreconcilable people. People. Because the truth is, sometimes we refuse to see the solutions. God has them in His Word we have good Christian counsel that we can go to, and we know what we need to do, but we just sort of refuse to see the solutions, and then we refuse to equally submit one to the other, and we refuse to let God come in and bring healing to the situation because we are irreconcilable people. Many times that's the real problem. It's not incompatibility, it's immaturity. It's when we move somehow that day we got married and we say, I do. And then life happens and we go through all these scenarios in life and then we get to the point where we say, I'm done. How did we get from I do to I'm done? Well, if we're going to have the kind of marriages that God wants us to have, we've got to be willing to obey His Word. Now, here's two startling facts about marriage. Number one, your spouse is going to hurt you. They're going to say something that hurts your feelings. They're going to give you a look that's haughty. That will hurt your feelings. They're going to do something that will hurt your feelings. And the other fact is this on that same coin is you are going to hurt your spouse. She's going to hurt you. He's going to hurt you. And then you're going to hurt them. That's just the way it works in life because we're human beings. We're not perfect. So how can we take those arguments, those disagreements, and how can we fight constructively? How can that happen? Can it happen? Well, you have to make it a mission in your heart that in our conversations, my mission is to bring healing. And in our conversations, my mission will be to build up and not tear down. And if we will say to ourselves when these tense moments occur, my mission is to bring healing. My mission is to build up. It will make all the difference in the world in your relationship. So I want to share with you five things this morning that I want to encourage you to jot down somewhere. And uh, remember these things because if you're not having a fight uh, right now, uh, you might be by this afternoon, right? <laughs> Here's the first thing. Always be honest. Always be honest. In verse 25, so stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. The truth of the matter is, lying destroys marriages. I cannot tell you the number of times that I've sat in a counseling meeting here at this church or other churches that I pastored where the spouse will find out for the first time that they've been being lied to. And it's devastating for them. They knew under the surface all along that something wasn't right, that something was wrong, but that one lie fell upon another lie, fell upon another lie, and they're trying to build a marriage on lies, but you can't do that. The truth is, uh, when you lie, it puts the situation in the dark. You're trying to cover it up. You're trying to put it in a corner somewhere, in a closet somewhere, hide it. But when you tell the truth, it brings that same situation into the light, and it gives God an opportunity to work. Did you know that lying hurts the husband and the wife? No matter who's doing the lying, it will hurt both of you. Have any of you uh, ever done like me and hit your thumb with a hammer? <laughs> what do you do? Your thumb's not the only thing that hurts. When you hit your thumb with a hammer, it feels like your whole body is hurting. And you start jumping around and you start saying things like, praise the Lord Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It hurts. When, I mean, your whole body is affected when you hit your thumb with a hammer. So there are a lot of benefits in telling the truth. It, it brings harmony to the couple. It brings unity. It unifies the couple. When you're honest with one another, you've got something to build on. When you're dishonest with, no, with one another, you're on a slippery slope there. You're never going to have any foundation in your marriage. So how are we supposed to speak the truth? Ephesians 4, 15 tells us. Instead, we will speak the truth in love 
growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Now, you don't tell the truth to hurt someone. You don't use the truth as a weapon. John MacArthur wrote this, truth without love is brutality. Love without truth is sentimentality. You see, we're supposed to speak the truth to one another, but the Bible says we're supposed to wrap up the truth in what? In love. Well, I was curious about this lying thing. What percentage of couples lie to one another on a regular basis? I was shocked when I found that out. This is a little research, and according to studies, about 70% of couples lie to one another regularly. 70% of couples. You can't build a foundation with lies. You can't have a, a relationship that is enriched when the relationship is being built with lies. You say, okay, well, what does it mean to lie? We, we lie in many different ways, don't we? Uh, some of these will hit home with you. One way is through hyperbole. Hyperbole means exaggeration. For instance, you might say to your husband, he walks in the door, you are always in a bad mood. Is that true? Is your husband always in a bad mood? But we say that. A man might look at his wife and say, you're always upset about something. Is that true, men? No. But we will often say, you're always like this. Or you might even say, ladies, you never listen. Is that true? There's sometimes we men actually listen, right? It's few and far between, but on occasion it happens when a miracle takes place. Amen. So, one of the things is hyperbole. Implication is another. Now, this is kind of a little bit tricky, but that's when we lie by stating something that's factual, but we're insinuating that the opposite is true. Well, what does that mean? Let me give you an example. You walk in the door as a husband, and you say, good, my wife is sober today. <laughs> Implying that she's never sober, right? Or a wife might say, good, my husband's not mean to me today implying the opposite. So, implication is another way that we lie. Here's another one, revenge. You've hurt me, so I'm going to get even. Whatever you do to me, I'm going to do 10 times worse to you. If you say something ugly to me, I'm going to say something that will blow you out of the water. It's going to be so explosive. If you look at me in a mean way, in a mean fashion, I'm going to give you a look that will blow your head apart. That's what I'm going to do. It's going to be worse because I'm going to get revenge. That's another way that we lie to one another. How about this? Here's another way. Avoidance. You don't tell the whole story. You tell a part of the story, but not the whole story. Why? Because you're trying to avoid conflict at all costs. So, you tell your spouse just part of the story. And you might be saying this, well, I just love them so much, I don't want to say the whole thing. I don't want to tell the whole thing because it would hurt them. And I'm thinking about them. No, sir. No, ma'am. You're not thinking about them at all. You're protecting yourself and not your mate. Protecting yourself and not your mate. So, we need to understand that avoidance is a form of lying. Well, we can look at the truth and we can look at lying and we can contrast those things. Contrasting the truth and lying. When we tell the truth, the Bible teaches us that God begins to work. As soon as we're honest with one another and as soon as we start telling each other the truth, it triggers something and God goes to work. It starts bringing an openness in a relationship. It starts being, bringing trust into the relationship when you're honest with one another. Obversely, when you lie, guess who goes to work? Not God, the old devil. And when you lie, the old devil sees it as an opportunity and he begins to close up real communication. You might think you've gotten by with a lie, but you haven't. You might think, well, I told her or him one, and they'll never find out the truth. But God always knows the truth, and you know the truth. And so, the relationship begins to erode when you lie to one another. So, it says, stop lying. Everybody say, stop lying. Here's the second thing. Don't let anger take over. Don't let anger take over in verse 26. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Now, let's talk about what that says and what it doesn't say. What it does say and what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, don't ever get angry. That's not what it says. It does say, 
You can get angry, but don't sin. You see, there's a thing called righteous anger. In other words, there are times in life when it is absolutely appropriate to be angry about something, righteously angry. When Chelsea was about five years old, our daughter, we were in a family, and I put in quote, quote, quotation marks, a family bookstore. And uh, she's about five years old. She, she's a little tiny thing. And she walked up to a, some shelving there that had some books on it. And she's right eye level with what I would consider to be pornographic material. And I, I mean, I just felt a righteous anger come all over me. I really did. And so I called one of the workers over. I said, can you explain this to me? And very flippantly, she said, well, those are books. I said, okay, I'm done with you. Go get your manager. And she went and got the manager. The manager comes over. I said, can you explain this to me? You're supposed to be a family bookstore. and You've got this kind of garbage here on display where my little five-year-old daughter is eye to eye with it. Can you explain this to me? He goes, yep, those are books for people that like that kind of thing. I said, okay, I'm done with you. I want your supervisor's name. And so I called up the supervisor. And I'm telling you, I was angry when I talked to the supervisor. She started to cry. I said, I can't believe that I, I went in there. I trust you to have good material in there, family type material. And you've got that kind of garbage on display. And, and my daughter saw it and I'm upset by it. She starts crying. And she said, sir, I agree with you 100%. And your phone call will make a difference. Now I can go to the board with a complaint from a customer and I can talk to them about what kind of material we have in that bookstore. I said, well, I'm never going to shop there again. About two weeks later, she called me up. And she said, have you been back in our bookstore? And I said, no, ma'am, I told you I'm not going to shop there anymore. She said, oh, you can shop there now because of your phone call. We took that material out of our bookstores. You know what Christians have done? Ah, we can't do anything about it. We just laid down, haven't we? We've just laid down. Listen, if something makes you righteously angry, you need to follow up on that anger. Because God says that's a good thing to be righteously angry and say, we're not going to have this. Calling up your senators, calling up your congresspersons and calling them up and saying, we're not going to have this. And if you vote for this, I'm going to do everything in my power to get you out of office because we're done with this kind of garbage. Righteous anger. However, if I'd gone home upset from the bookstore that Chelsea had seen that, and I walk in the house and I look around and say, Robin, the house is a mess because I'm angry. And what have you been doing all day? And where's my dinner? It's past time for dinner. And I start taking my anger out on her. Then it moves from being righteous anger into sinful anger. Does that make sense to you? So there's a thing called righteous anger. And, uh, but don't, don't let it turn. The Bible says don't let it turn into sinful anger. In Proverbs 29, 11, fools give, off, or give full vent to the rage, but the wise bring calm in the end. I'm always amazed by couples who say, I just can't control my anger. I can't. My daddy was an angry man. My grandpappy was an angry man. And I just come by it naturally. It's in our genetics. It's in our DNA. I just cannot control my anger. And so you get a husband and wife together and they're upset about something. They're yelling at one another. They're fighting one another. They're calling each other. Names. They just are completely out of control. They can't help themselves. And then the phone rings and they go, Hello. You can control it. You choose not to control it. Does that make sense to you? So don't, don't come up with that excuse. I just can't just always model for me that way. Then grow up and be, be better than the, what was modeled for you. Amen? So you can control it. Many people think, well, anger, if anger is justifiable, then a sinful response is justifiable as well. For instance, a wife might come home from work early. She walks into the bedroom, catches her husband in there with another woman, and she gets a shotgun and shoots him in the head, and all the women would probably say, amen? <laughs> no. No. A sinful response to a sin, an act of sin is not good either. See, sin, sin done to you does not justify sin done by you. And that's how we get into that thing of calling each other names and being disrespectful for one, to one another and giving haughty looks to each other because they sinned against me, I'm going to sin against them. 
The Bible says don't do that. Now, here's something to think about. The Bible teaches us don't get involved in unnecessary fights. You know, I, I would venture to guess that 99.9% .9 of the fights we get into as couples are completely and totally unnecessary. We just interject things that we know we're pushing buttons when we do it. Listen to the Bible in Proverbs 26, 17. He who passes by and meddles in a quarrel, not his own, is like one who takes a dog by the ears. You know what it's saying? If you take a dog by the ears, that dog is going to do what? He's going to bite you. And sometimes we'll push a button here and push a button there, and then we wonder why our spouse gets upset because we've taken a dog by the ears, and now they're trying to bite us. They're trying to bite us. So don't get involved in unnecessary quarrels. They don't do anything to build up your relationship. Here's the third thing. Clean out the ashes every day. If you've got a fire going and you let the ashes get too piled up, it will eventually put the fire out. Verse 26, don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. King James says, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath, upon your anger. Passion becomes very cold when you allow the sun to go down upon your wrath because you're letting the ashes pile up higher and higher and higher and it's putting out the passion, it's putting out the fire. It's like putting another brick in the wall uh, that's separating you from your spouse every single time that you do that. So you're going to be angry. There's no question about that. But here's what happens when you go to bed angry. I, I looked it up. I did a lot of study on this. It says it's like cementing those hard feelings. So I've got all this anger built up and I go to bed and somehow in the night while I'm asleep, those angry feelings are cemented into place. And guess what happens when you cement something together? It's really hard to break it apart and get rid of it, isn't it? It gets harder every single time that you do that. Have you ever heard this? Time heals everything. That's a lie. Don't believe that for one second. Time does not heal anything. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, how about the next time you go to the doctor and the doctor looks at you and says, you know, you've got some horrible disease, but let's just wait and see how it turns out. <laughs> Would you go back to that doctor? No. Not at all. Not at all. Time heals nothing. Now, time will give you a different perspective on the situation, but it won't heal anything. So don't use that as an excuse. When you go to bed angry, the Bible teaches you're giving the old devil a foothold. You're giving the devil a stronghold. You are inviting demons into your relationship when you go to bed angry. And you know what's something else that people do sometimes? They play the freeze out game. Okay, I'm mad, I'm angry at you. I'm not going to talk to you. Have you men learned that when you say, honey, what's wrong? And she says, nothing. <laughs> that she just lied. <laughs> Something's wrong. When a woman quits talking to you, it's because they're mad. It's not a good thing, ladies, listen, or men. It's not a good thing to play the freeze-out game and quit talking to each other. You're only going to make the problem worse. It's going to be worse. Talk things out. Don't go to bed angry. Here's the fourth thing. Watch what you say and how you say it. In verse 29, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. So don't use foul or abusive language. You know, when Chelsea was a little girl playing softball, I had coached her two older brothers in baseball. And, you know, when, a, when one of your kids messes up in baseball, they miss a grounder or they miss a fly ball or something. You call a boy over and say, hey, what were you thinking, man? That, that was an easy grounder. You know how to catch that. Work on that. Practice that. You can catch those balls. And the kid will say, okay, okay. Little boy will, okay. And then I learned when I was coaching Chelsea's team that if you said, how come you missed that grounder? They start crying. You know, you can take a little baby boy and hold him up in the air and go, yeah, you know, like that. And they'll just laugh. They'll smile. You take a baby girl and go, yeah, they'll start crying. <laughs> because males are different than females. Females are different than males. So, the Bible teaches us right here, don't let any foul or abusive language come out of your mouth. 
What does the word foul or corrupt or abusive mean? It means rotten, worthless, and harmful. Rotten, worthless, and harmful. So it's saying, don't let any rotten, worthless, harmful language come out of your mouth. That only purpose is to tear down the listener. How often are we guilty of that? Saying something that we know is going to hurt the other person. So instead it says, use words of encouragement. Well, pastor, they don't deserve it. Who of us deserves the forgiveness of God? None of us. You know what it's called? It's called grace, isn't it? Sometimes you give something to someone that they don't deserve. They don't deserve what you're giving them because of something called grace. It's called grace. So you learn how to use your words. Men, you could look at your wife and say, Honey, when I look at you, the wheels of time come to a stop. Oh, she's just going to melt if you do that. Or if you looked at her and said, honey, you've got a face that would stop a clock. <laughs> a lot different, right? It's a whole lot different. So what if the next time your wife says something ugly to you men, you look at her and say, honey, you are as beautiful as the day I married you. And ladies, what if the next time your husband acts ugly, what if you were to look at him and say, honey, I'm as beautiful as the day you married me. <laughs> you know what our nature is? I'm going to win this argument. Have we learned yet that when you try to win, you wind up, both of you wind up losing? Does it have to be a win-lose scenario, everything? How, why can't we play to win-win? You win, I win. We're both going to win. It doesn't even cross our minds so many times. So listen to God's Word. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Now, folks, either the Bible is true or it's not true. How many of you believe it's true? Use your words wisely. Here's the last thing. Be quick to forgive. Be quick to forgive. In verse 31, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Charles Spurgeon, wonderful preacher, wonderful man of God. Um, Nathan Lorick, who is the executive director of the SBTC on my 25th anniversary here, he gave me a handwritten sermon notes from Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And I am so thankful for those. But here's what Charles Spurgeon said. Let us go to Calvary to learn how we may be forgiven. Then let us linger there to learn how to forgive. Have we forgotten that? We go to Calvary to learn how to be forgiven. But then he says, linger there so you learn how to forgive others. See, none of us, not one person in this room deserves the forgiveness of God. And that means because of that, none of us have the right to not forgive. Years ago, I saw a man who was in court. Another man had murdered his daughter. And they were allowing the family to speak to the murderer. It came his turn, this, this father. And he stood up and he had tears running down his face. He said, sir... He says to the murderer, I am a Christian. And because I am a Christian, I've been commanded to forgive you. So, sir, I want to tell you something. I forgive you. And when he said that, that murderer broke. He began to weep and weep. And when I saw it, I thought, I don't know if I could do that. What a tall order that is. Yet the Bible says to live in a spirit of forgiveness. A lack of forgiveness will only destroy. There was a couple that we were very good friends with in the last church I pastored in Oklahoma. We'd go to their house and eat dinner. They'd come to ours and eat dinner. They were one of the first couples to come and visit us after we moved here. Uh, we, we did a lot of things. Went to the movies with them. Did a lot of things together. But the man messed up one night and he had a one night stand. 
He confessed to his wife what he had done. He was broken by it. He came and talked to me first, and then he confessed to his wife, and he was broken by it. He couldn't believe that he had done it. He was so ashamed of himself, and he begged her forgiveness. And they tried for a few months, but after a while she said, I just can't forgive him. I can't forgive him. I won't forgive him. And so they divorced. And she wound up marrying a sorry human being, a sorry man. She personally told me I would have been so much better off if I had worked it out with her first husband than what I've got now. I should have worked it out with him. Yeah, we all make mistakes. And you have to do whatever the Lord leads you to do in life. But one thing I know he's told us to do is forgive ye one another. Amen. Amen. It takes a lot of forgiveness when you're in a marriage. But give it out. Don't be selfish with it. Don't be stingy. Be quick to forgive. 